My name is Roger Varma. I'm the product manager for IFM Effector. Today I'm going to present to you our training seminar on proximity switches. In the last 10 to 15 years, the North American industry has made a very rapid transition from relay logic controls to solid state PLC controls. We're in the second phase of this transition. Traditional devices like mechanical limit switches are being replaced with solid state sensors. The most common type of solid state sensors being applied today in industry are proximity switches. This training seminar is designed to give you a better understanding of the operating principles for proximity switches and how to apply the right switch in the right application. The training seminar itself is divided into various modules. Each module covers a subject such as operating principle, sensing range correct characteristics, electrical wiring, and mounting considerations. In between some of the modules, I'll give you a hands-on demonstration to summarize the key points. During the seminar, if you have any questions, please write them down. Afterwards, you can call the IFM Effector Application Assistance Line. Our phone number is 1-800-348-8899. Our engineers will answer your questions and will help you with any applications where you may want to apply proximity switches. With this training seminar, we also sent you a copy of our training manual. The training manual summarizes all the key points and gives you an overview of all the various modules that we're going to cover today. If you need more copies of the training manual, please fill out the request form. Print your name, phone number, and title, and fax or mail the form to Effector. Both the fax number and the mailing addresses are listed on the form. Let's now start with the first module that covers the operating principles for proximity switches and also the sensing range characteristics. Proximity switches are electronic sensors used to detect the presence of an object within a very defined sensing zone. As position sensors, proximity switches replace mechanical limit switches, which have an actuator that physically touches the target in order to sense its presence. But mechanical switches are high maintenance devices. Actuators stick, break, and wear, and mechanical contacts have finite life expectancies. However, proximity switches are completely solid state devices. There are no contacts to wear and bounce. And proximity switches provide non-contact sensing. So there are no actuators to wear, break, or get out of alignment. And because there is no actuator shaft, Proximity switches can be sealed against harsh environments. Proximity switches have no mechanical components, so they can reduce downtime and increase productivity. This seminar is going to cover inductive sensing and capacitive sensing, the two most common technologies. Inductive switches sense metallic or other conductive materials, normally in machine control applications. Inductive switches should always be your first choice with metal targets in machine control applications. Capacitive switches, on the other hand, can sense non-metallic objects. They should be used for product detection and for level detection of liquids and granular solids. So, choose a capacitive switch for non-metallic targets and for product detection and level control applications. Now we're going to look at inductive switches and what you should be aware of when applying them. First is the specified sensing range and the factors that affect it. An inductive proximity switch contains a coil and a ferrite core. Together, these two components form the inductive portion of an LC tuned circuit, which drives an oscillator. This coil and core set up a very low energy electromagnetic field which is radiated from the active face of the switch. When an electrical conductor, such as a metal target, enters this field, eddy currents are set up within the conductor. These eddy currents draw energy from the field. At a certain point, the eddy current losses are large enough that the amplifier cannot output sufficient energy. Oscillations stop and the field collapses. This 40-year-old well-proven principle is called a killed eddy current oscillator. Therefore, an inductive switch oscillates when the target is absent 
and does not oscillate when the target is present. Proximity switches have a specified nominal sensing range determined by a standard test procedure. Under these test conditions, a 30 millimeter cylindrical switch has a turn on and turn off graph which looks like this. The inside solid line designates where the switch will turn on as the target approaches. The outside broken line shows where the switch will turn off as the target passes the switch. The difference between turn on and turn off, or hysteresis, provides stable operation by preventing the switch from chattering between the on and off states. The most obvious factor that determines the sensing range is the size of the switch itself. The strength of the radiated field is determined by the size of the core inside the switch. Larger switches have larger cores and therefore longer sensing ranges. So, always select a proximity switch that is large enough to provide adequate range for the application. Plus, good practice dictates that a proximity switch should operate at 50% to 80% of its range to avoid marginal conditions. Excuse me, Bill, but why not operate the switch at 100% of its range? Good question, Joe. One example of why you want to operate in the 50 to 80% range is to allow for wear of the actuating device. The testing for nominal range uses a mild steel target that is a specified size. The actual material, size, and shape will determine the sensing range in a real-world application. The turn-on, turn-off graphs we saw earlier were based on a mild steel target. When the target is not steel, the graphs for the switch will be different. With a stainless steel target, the maximum sensing range will only be about 70% of the nominal range. And with an aluminum target, the actual sensing range will be only about 40% of the nominal range. So, remember to correct for the material and then have the switch operate at 50% of that range. Bill, I have a question. Suppose I'm running a can line that has both aluminum and steel cans. What am I supposed to do? Well, Sue, if you set the switch up for the aluminum, it will sense the steel cans with no problem. Here are correction factors for some common materials. For a metal not shown here, contact your effector representative for the correction factor. Target thickness normally doesn't affect sensing range. For very thin targets, such as metal foil, the actual sensing range may be longer than the nominal range. The size of the target does affect the actual sensing range. The specified range is based on a target that is large enough to cover the entire active face of the switch. If the target is smaller, the turn on, turn off graph will be different and the actual range will be shorter. And shapes that present smaller cross sections, such as cylinders, spheres, or screw heads, will result in a still shorter sensing range. For example, a bolt in a rotating shaft will not provide the specified sensing range. In an application like this, adjust the switch by moving it closer to the target until the LED just comes on. Then, move the switch 50% closer to the target. This will put the switch at the midpoint of its range for reliable operation. So, to summarize, when you're evaluating the sensing range needed for your application, Select a switch that is large enough to provide adequate range. Remember to correct for target material if it is not steel. Try to have a target that is at least as large as the active face of the switch and operate the switch at about 50% of its actual range in that application. We saw in the last module that there are three key points that affect sensing range. First of all, the size of the ferrite core. Secondly, the type of material that's being used as a target. And finally, the shape or size of the target itself. Let's illustrate these points. For a target, I'm going to use a piece of flat, mild steel. 
I have two proximity switches here. Both are wired to DC power supplies to illustrate this point. One is an 18 millimeter switch and the other is an 8 millimeter diameter switch. The 8 millimeter inductive proximity switch has a smaller ferrite core than the 18 millimeter. Therefore, it has a smaller sensing range. Let's look at that. You can see the sensing range is approximately one millimeter. The 18 millimeter switch, on the other hand, that has a larger ferrite core, has considerably more sensing range. Approximately five millimeters. Therefore, the larger the ferrite core, the more sensing range you would have for an application. The second point that affects the sensing range is the target material. So far, we've been using a piece of mild steel. But what happens if we decide to use another material for a target? Let's look at an aluminum target. Same size, but just made out of aluminum. I'm going to use the 18 millimeter switch to illustrate the point. On mild steel, I'm getting five millimeters of range. On aluminum, you can see I'm getting considerably less range. The reason being, aluminum has a correction factor. The correction factor for aluminum is actually 0.4. Therefore, my working range is 0.4 times five millimeter, which is the sensing range on this coil. Anytime you're working with a material other than mild steel, always use a correction factor. The correction factors are listed in the training manual and also in the effector sensor catalog. If you need more information, call our application assistance line. And finally, the third point that affects the sensing range is the shape and size of the target. So far, we've used a piece of flat metal for a target. But what happens if we decide to look at some different shapes? For example, this screw head with the 18 millimeter proximity switch. As you can see, I'm barely getting a millimeter of sensing range, if that. Therefore, select a target that is at least the size of the proximity switch sensing phase. There's one more way to increase the sensing range for a proximity switch, and that is to use a non-flush sensor. Let's look at the next module, which covers this point in more detail. In addition to the nominal sensing range, the manufacturer will specify whether a proximity switch is flush mountable or non-flush mountable. We have seen that an inductive switch contains a coil and ferrite core which produces a low energy oscillating electromagnetic field. Some switches also include a magnetic shield which surrounds the core. Proximity switches without the shield, non-flush mountable switches, have a relatively wide sensing area that extends beyond the sides of the switch. The shield, however, shapes the electromagnetic field and produces a narrower sensing area. The shielded or flush mountable switch also has a sensing range which is 25 to 50 percent shorter than a non-flush unit of the same size. The terms flush and non-flush refer to the mounting of the switch. Looking at the active sensing area of a non-flush switch, you see that it can detect a target which is not actually in front of the switch. The non-flush switch will also side sense any bracket or other metal surrounding the tip of the switch. So, non-flush switches must have a metal-free zone surrounding their active face, which is the way proximity switches are used in most applications. Cylindrical models must have a metal-free zone equal to the diameter of the switch surrounding the circumference. And there should be no metal behind the active face for a distance of twice the sensing range. For rectangular configurations, if there is metal on one side, it should be kept at a distance of 1.5 times the width of the active face. If there is metal along two sides, keep it at a distance of two times the width of the active face. For all units, tubular or rectangular, keep any metal in front of the switch at a distance of three times the sensing range.
These guidelines are used when the metal is steel. Remember that other metals reduce the sensing range and will have a correspondingly smaller effect on side sensing by a non-flush switch. Excuse me, Bill. Are you saying I could locate an aluminum guard closer than a steel guard? That's exactly what I'm saying, Tom. Here's a switch with a steel guard. The metal-free zone must be equal to the diameter of the switch. If that guard is made of aluminum, the metal-free zone can be as small as 40% of the diameter. A flush switch, because of its narrower active zone, will only sense metal directly in front of the active face. So these switches can be mounted flush with a metal surface for protection of the switch. The narrower active zone makes flush switches a better choice for applications such as sensing through the metal rollers of a conveyor. And flush switches can be mounted closer together without interference between units. We saw that it's good practice to have the target as large as the active sensing zone. Because flush switches have a narrower sensing zone, they are a better choice to use with small targets. One final consideration. Flush switches have less hysteresis. When exact target position is important, use a switch with minimum hysteresis, usually the smallest flush switch possible, and keep the target at 50% of the range. Bill, we have a lot of installations of non-flush switches that do not adhere to these guidelines for a metal-free area surrounding the switch. Well, Sue, that's because these guidelines are very conservative. In many applications, non-flush switches will work with the metal located closer. But because of pre-damping, they may not give you the same performance in terms of RFI protection, hysteresis, and target detection. So when choosing between non-flush and flush switches, remember, non-flush switches provide the longest range in a given size housing. They are usually the best choice except for these specific conditions. Flush designs will tolerate metal in the mounting area and are more protected against mechanical damage. Because of their narrower sensing zone, they are also a better choice for small targets and where repeatability is important. The key point in the last module was that flush mountable switches have less range than non-flush mountable switches. I have here two 18 millimeter diameter proximity switches. This one is flush mountable and this one is non-flush mountable. Let's see what happens when we mount these devices in a bracket. Here is a flush mountable switch mounted in a bracket. It's surrounded by metal in all directions. As you can see it's only sensing a target on the sensing phase. It's not sensing the mounting bracket walls. However, when we mount a non-flush switch in this bracket, we have to make sure we follow the mounting guidelines. Now I'm going to mount this non-flush switch in the same mounting block. Let's see now what happens when I turn the power supply on. You can see the switch right now is back sensing the mounting block itself. So we need to move it farther back. When the bracket's far enough back, the switch does not sense the bracket. It only senses the target on the sensing face again. Therefore, if you follow the mounting guidelines for non-flush mountable switches versus flush mountable switches, you can increase the working range in an application. There are certain areas where flush mountable switches have advantages over non-flush mountable switches. One is speed monitoring. Let's look at the next module that discusses this subject. Because they are solid state devices, proximity switches operate much faster than mechanical switches. To evaluate response time in a given application, remember that an inductive switch oscillates if the target is absent. When the target is present, oscillation stops. As a target enters the active zone, the output of the oscillator drops towards zero. A short time later, 
the output stage switches. The time between the target being detected and the change in output is the turn on delay. As the target leaves the active zone, oscillation begins again. When the oscillator reaches a predetermined level, the output switches again. This interval is the turn off delay and it can typically range from twice as long to 10 times longer than the turn on delay. As multiple targets pass through the sensing zone, the time required to make one complete transition from on to off and back to on again is the cycle time. As a measure of speed, the proximity switch industry specifies a maximum switching rate for each model. This switching rate is based on test conditions where target present time and target absent time are equal. But what happens when these times are not equal? When, for example, the targets are small compared to the space between them? Because a proximity switch has a shorter turn on delay when the target absent time is large compared to target present time, a proximity switch can operate faster than the maximum switching rate. But turn off delay in a proximity switch is longer. When targets are large compared to the space between them, a point will be reached where the switch cannot turn off fast enough. In these situations, the switch may be slower than the maximum switching rate specified. The most difficult applications are therefore rapidly moving repetitive targets with a small space between them. One common example is counting gear teeth, in this case with a non-flush switch. At this point, a tooth is entering the active zone. The switch senses the tooth and turns on. But as that tooth leaves the active zone, the next tooth is about to enter the zone. Chances are the switch will not have enough time to turn off. Here's the same application using a flush switch. The tooth is entering the active zone. The switch senses the tooth and turns on. When the tooth leaves the zone, there is more time until the next tooth arrives because the zone is narrower. And the switch will probably have enough time to turn off. So if turn off delay could be a problem, use a flush switch. If turnoff delay is not a problem, for example, a fast moving target with lots of space between targets, the wider active zone of a non-flush switch will give you more time to sense the target. Bill, it sounds like this whole area of switching speed is kind of complicated. Not really, Jack. Where speed is important, some simple rules will eliminate most problems. First, in any speed critical application, use DC switches. A DC switch can be up to 30 times faster than an AC switch of the same size. For even faster response, consider quadranorm switches. In a conventional inductive switch, the target causes the oscillator output to drop to zero. The relatively long off delay is the time needed for the oscillator to recover. However, in a quadranorm switch, the oscillator output does not go to zero. Instead, the circuit continues to oscillate at a reduced amplitude. Therefore, the oscillator output recovers much quicker, greatly reducing off delay. Quadranorm switches will operate at higher speeds than conventional DC switches. Some other guidelines to keep in mind are that flush switches will operate faster than non-flush units in most applications with repetitive targets. And smaller switches will operate faster than larger switches. Sometimes proximity switches are blamed for being too slow when the real problem is the device that the switch is connected to. If the input device isn't fast enough, a fast proximity switch won't help the application. In summary, when evaluating speed of response, remember that conventional DC switches are much faster than AC switches, and quadranorm units are even faster. Flush mountable switches are usually faster than non-flush mountable switches, and smaller switches are faster than larger switches.
two key points in the last module. Number one, DC switches are faster than AC switches. And number two, flush mountable switches are faster than non-flush mountable switches. When you're considering proximity switches for speed monitoring, there's also one more point to consider, and that is the PLC scan time. Make sure your PLC is fast enough for the application. Majority of the cases, the proximity switch will be faster than the PLC input card. If you have any questions on speed monitoring, please call our application assistance line. So far now, we've learned how to select a proximity switch based on the sensing range and the flush or non-flush mounting. There's one more question that comes up, and that is the electrical interface. There are two choices for electrical interface. One is AC interface, and the second is DC interface. Let's look at the next module to illustrate both types. Once you decide to use proximity switches in your application, the next step is to select a specific switch. The first decision is whether the switch will be powered by an AC or DC supply. What are the advantages of each? Well, DC switches are less expensive than AC switches. Why the big cost difference, Bill? Well, Tom, we probably have more AC switches operating than any other manufacturer. And our experience has taught us that AC lines in industrial plants are not the cleanest power source available. The switches need input protection, and that protection adds to the cost. If you interface with a programmable controller, you'll also save because DC input-output modules are less expensive. In fact, many programmable controllers are DC-only devices. DC switches are always faster than AC units, and in most cases, they are very much faster. For example, an 18 millimeter AC switch will have a maximum switching rate of 25 hertz. The equivalent three-wire DC unit gives you a switching rate of 500 hertz. And finally, DC units are normally safer with less regulatory concerns because of their normally lower voltage. Bill, if DC switches have all of these advantages, why use an AC unit? Well, Jill, if you have a choice, you normally will want to choose DC switches. But many installations don't have DC available, and that's where AC switches come in. Now, a lot of plants have a mix of AC and DC applications. Here, you may want to consider AC-DC proximity switches. These units will typically operate from any power supply from 20 to 250 volts AC and 20 to 250 volts DC. So, to summarize, when you have a choice between AC and DC, remember, DC switches are less expensive, they'll be less expensive to interface, and they'll give you faster operating speeds. We saw in the last module that DC switches offer a number of advantages over AC switches. However, DC controls are relatively new in some industries. There are plants that have a combination of both DC and AC controls. If you have a situation like that, the best type of switch to use is an AC-DC type. This is an effector AC-DC limit switch style proximity sensor. The unit is designed to operate on 20 to 250 volts AC and 20 to 250 volt DC. If you have applications that require both AC and DC types of switches, this is the best unit to work with. It can handle both types. I have it right now wired to 110 power and the load is a relay coil. As you can hear, the switch is pulling the ice cube relay. I can take the same switch now and power it up with my DC box and switch the output. Let's unscrew the switch from the relay coil and wire it up to the DC switch box. Now you can see the same switch is wired to the DC battery box 
and it's operating off DC power. AC-DC switches offer a lot of advantages and use them wherever possible, especially if you have a combination of AC and DC controls in the plant. There are two types of DC switches, two-wire DC switches and three-wire. Let's look at the next module. It covers both types. AC and AC-DC switches are two-wire devices. With DC switches, you have a choice between two-wire and three-wire units. The familiar mechanical switch has two wires and is simply wired in series with the load. And a two-wire proximity switch is wired exactly the same way. When the mechanical switch is closed, it has essentially a zero voltage drop. But the proximity switch uses electrical energy, not mechanical energy. When a two-wire switch is closed, it has a voltage drop in the order of four to four and a half volts. When a mechanical switch is open, it has no current flowing through it. With an open two-wire proximity switch, there is a small current called leakage current flowing through the circuit. A three-wire proximity switch is different because energy for the switch is supplied through a third wire. When the three-wire switch is closed, it has a smaller voltage drop usually one to two and a half volts. And when it is open, the three-wire switch has essentially zero leakage current. So, Bill, to avoid problems, I should use three-wire DC switches. Well, Joe, that's not the case at all. Two-wire switches have many advantages. For example, because there is one less wire to connect, two-wire switches cost less to install. Three-wire switches are polarity sensitive. You must specify and stock separate switches for positive or negative switching applications. But two-wire switches are not polarity sensitive. You can stock one switch and reduce the spares needed. And the same switch will interface with both positive and negative switching programmable controllers. While we're on the subject of programmable controllers, the input modules for some low-cost units only provide connections for the input channel and common. These programmable controllers won't even accommodate three-wire sensors without the addition of a separate power supply. Two-wire switches are also easier and simpler to wire in parallel and series circuits if you understand their limitations. If you must wire in series or parallel, contact your effector representative for details on these limitations. But the simplest and surest way to handle parallel and series circuits is to perform the logic in the programmable controller. When you evaluate leakage current into a programmable controller, remember, in a positive switching circuit, the PC will turn off when the input voltage is low. Therefore, leakage current multiplied by the input impedance must be less than the turn-off voltage of the programmable controller. In a negative switching circuit, the programmable controller turns off when the input voltage is high. So the supply voltage minus the leakage current multiplied by input impedance must be greater than the turn off voltage. In addition, with negative switching circuits, voltage drop can sometimes be a problem. The programmable controller will turn on when the voltage is low. So voltage drop across the switch must be less than the turn-on voltage of the programmable controller. If you're not sure about interfacing with a programmable controller, call our applications engineering department. In summary, three-wire switches will give you essentially zero leakage current, plus a lower voltage drop. Two-wire switches have low leakage, they cost less to install, they can reduce wiring confusion and reduce inventory because they are polarity insensitive. They can be directly interfaced with a low-cost programmable controller without an additional power supply and are all around simpler to use. The key point in the last module was that three-wire switches are polarity sensitive and two-wire switches are not. I have two three-wire switches in my hand. One is positive switching, the other 
is negative switching. As you can see, these two three-wire switches mechanically look identical. However, electrically, they're very different. I have here two battery boxes that represent PLC inputs. This one here is a positive switching input. The load is tied to minus and needs a plus to turn on. This one here is a negative switching input. The load is tied to plus and needs a minus to turn on. I've got the positive switching sensor tied to the correct box. What happens now if I take this positive switching switch and wire it to the wrong input? Let's see what happens. I've got the positive switching switch wired to a negative switching input. As you can see, the LED is turning on and off, but the switch is not switching the input. This is a really key point. When you're troubleshooting, do not look at the LED on the switch. Try to look at your input card. If the switch is wired correctly, the input should switch. However, it's not wired correctly, it will not switch. So make sure you always look at the input card versus the LED on the switch. As you can see, three-wire switches are polarity sensitive, but two-wire switches are not. I have here a two-wire proximity switch. It will work with both positive switching inputs and negative switching input. Let me illustrate this. Let's wire this two-wire switch to the positive switching box first. The unit works fine. It's switching the input. Now I can take the same switch and wire it to the negative switching input. And the unit should work again. As you can see, two wire switches will work with either type of input. If you have both positive and negative switching inputs on the plant floor, it will interface with both types of devices. Furthermore, there is one less wire to work with. There are only two wires involved. It's going to save your wiring time when you're interfacing a number of switches in an application. If you have any questions, please call our 1-800 application assistance line. Our engineers will help you select the right switch for your interface. There is one more point to consider, and that is the termination on the proximity switch itself. There are three different choices available. Let's look at the next module. It covers all three types. With effector proximity switches, you have three choices on how to make the electrical connections. You can select pre-cabled units or switches with built-in terminal chambers or proximity switches with quick disconnect connectors. Each offers certain advantages. For example, cabled units are normally the least expensive and they offer the greatest variety of switch types such as threaded tubulars in plastic and in metal construction including short body designs. Or you can choose smooth tubular units, switches in rectangular and limit switch style housings, or surface mounted units with a low profile. Switches with factory installed and sealed cables are always the preferred choice for wet applications. Switches with terminal chambers are a good choice to retrofit limit switches with pre-installed wiring or where extra long or other special cable assemblies are needed and for use with conduit since they provide a half inch conduit entry and most of these models can be programmed for normally open or normally closed operation by the way our quadrinorm switches provide this same versatility in a cabled unit the quickest and easiest way to make electrical connections is to use switches with quick disconnect connectors. These units should be used whenever there is a high potential for damage to the switch or where the wiring may be exposed to potential damage. Connectors that are not pre-wired can be installed on existing cables. This lets you replace a switch without the need to reroute the cable. Finally, 
a threaded tubular proximity switch with a connector could be easier to adjust than a cabled unit. How does wiring make it easier to adjust? Well, Jill, when you have to adjust a threaded tubular unit by running it in or out of a mounting bracket, the quick disconnect unit lets you adjust the switch, then attach the connector rather than twist the cable. So you have three choices on wiring a proximity switch. Pre-cabled units for cost reasons, for use in wet environments, or because they offer the largest variety of switches. Switches with terminal chambers are used with conduit to retrofit a mechanical switch or another proximity switch to give you the versatility of normally open or normally closed programming. Or when you have to use extra long cables, high flex wiring, or other types of custom cable assemblies. Quick disconnect switches are the best choice where quick, easy replacement is an important consideration. Or in a retrofit situation, and anywhere downtime is critical. I have in front of me three different types of proximity switches. One is a molded cable type of unit. The second is a terminal chamber unit and the third is a quick disconnect unit. Molded cable switches or pre-wired switches are best suited for condensing environment because they're factory sealed. Terminal chamber units are ideal for applications where you're retrofitting existing units like mechanical limit switches. They allow you to run cable to length and wire into the terminal. In this unit, there's also a five-way directional sensing head. This can be pointed in any of the five directions. Terminal chamber units also allow you to use a cord grip or a half inch conduit. Finally, the third type of termination is quick disconnect. The quick disconnect switches allow you to wire up a connector to the back end. These types of switches are ideal for applications where there are possibilities for mechanical damage to the switch. The change over time is very rapid and thus with quick disconnect switches you can cut your downtime. Let's look at the next module that shows us how to properly mount all three types of switches. One major advantage of proximity switches is that there is a size and shape to fit just about any application. The two most common mechanical forms are tubular switches, both threaded and smooth, and rectangular shapes, from very small to large. Why the big variety, Bill? Wouldn't it be simpler to have one or two sizes? Well, Tom, we make all these different sizes and shapes so they're easier for you to use. For example, let's look at why tubular configurations are a good choice. Threaded models are supplied with nuts for mounting in a bracket. Or, they can be threaded into a block, but remember the metal-free zone needed for non-flush mountable units. Smooth tubular units are supplied with mounting clamps to hold them in position, and are the simplest to replace. In either case, the proximity switch can easily be moved closer to, or farther away from, the target to establish the best operating condition. Now, that's both an advantage and a disadvantage because it's also easy for someone to misadjust the switch. We saw that the sensing range depends on the size of a magnetic core. For tubular switches, the active face, the face pointing toward the target, is the same size as the core. So tubular designs give you the longest range with the smallest X and Y dimensions. But a tubular switch has the largest Z dimension, perpendicular to the target plane. Plus, the wire requires even more room in that direction. In some applications, this configuration works to your advantage, such as sensing between the rolls of a conveyor. For applications which don't have space perpendicular to the target, rectangular styles have larger X and Y dimensions, but a smaller Z dimension essentially a lower profile. Because it is mounted on a flat surface, 
a rectangular unit is less susceptible to damage than a tubular unit in a bracket. And there's less chance of someone misadjusting it. Because they cannot be adjusted mechanically, some rectangular styles include electrically adjustable sensitivity. This adjustment should only be used to reduce the range. If you try to adjust for greater than the specified nominal range, you may cause instability. To summarize, tubular proximity switches are the easiest to adjust in the field. They also give you the smallest possible active face at the cost of a higher profile. Rectangular models are more difficult to adjust and have a larger active face, but they give you a lower profile. We have two types of mounting options, one for tubular inductive switches and the other for rectangular inductive switches. Threaded body styles can be mounted in an L bracket. Smooth body styles can be mounted in a plastic clamp. Both types of mounts allow a lot of adjustment and flexibility in an application. However, in an application, if you do not want the adjustment, then use the rectangular switch. Once the rectangular switch is mounted, it cannot be adjusted. So far, we've covered inductive proximity switches. The next topic for discussion is capacitive proximity switches. Let's look at the next module. Up until now, we've been discussing inductive switches. Now, let's look at capacitive switches and how they're different. We saw that an inductive switch radiated a low energy electromagnetic field. And when a conductive target entered this field, it drew energy from the field and oscillation stopped. For inductive switches, oscillation means the target is absent and the lack of oscillation means the target is present. Inductive proximity switches sense targets which are electrical conductors. The inductive switch oscillates because of an LC circuit. A capacitive switch also contains an oscillator. But in this case, the active face of the switch is one plate of a capacitor. The other plate is ground. When a target enters the active zone, the value of the capacitor changes. When the value of the capacitor is large enough, the circuit begins to oscillate. With a capacitive switch, oscillation occurs when the target is present, exactly the opposite of an inductive switch. Any target which increases capacitance can be sensed. So a capacitive switch can sense both conductors and non-conductors. Never use a capacitive switch when an inductive switch will do the job. You might introduce the chance of a false signal from an operator's hand or from cutting fluids, moisture, or dirt buildup. However, capacitive switches are very useful for product detection, where they sense bottles, bags, boxes, and other objects. Under the right set of conditions, capacitive switches can also sense through one object to detect a target behind it. One limitation is that the object between the switch and the target cannot be metal. This look-through ability creates one of the most common applications of capacitive switches, level detection. Here, the proximity switch senses through a sight glass, and we can even supply the clamps to mount them to the sight glass. In most level sensing applications, the proximity switch is installed through the tank wall in one of our mounting wells, either polyethylene, which is FDA approved, or Teflon. And always use a mounting well. They let you change a switch without draining the tank. And they protect the switch against abrasion and chemical attack. Plus, granular materials, such as grain or plastic pellets, can cause a static charge to build up, and the well will protect the switch. Our capacitive switches perform particularly well in level sensing because they have a potentiometer to adjust sensitivity. To adjust sensitivity, mount the switch in the actual application, fill the vessel, and then reduce the level so moisture and residue are present on the mounting well. The worst case conditions. If the LED is on, Turn the pot counterclockwise until the LED just goes off. 
If the LED was not on with the residue present, turn the pot clockwise until it does come on. Then back off just enough to make it go off. Raise the level above the switch and the LED should come on. Now turn the pot counterclockwise, counting the number of turns until it goes off. Finally, turn the pot clockwise for one half that number of turns. The switch will be set in the midpoint of its range for maximum stability. This example is for a normally open switch. For normally closed units, the operation of the LED would be exactly the opposite. To summarize the important differences between capacitive and inductive switches, remember, don't use a capacitive switch if an inductive switch will do the same job. Do use a capacitive switch for non-metallic targets, for level detection, and to look through one object to sense a second object. We just saw that capacitive switches are ideal for sensing non-metallic targets. For example, this piece of wood. The other property that capacitive switches have is that you can tune out non-metallic objects and sense right through them. Let's illustrate that with an example. I'm going to turn the sensitivity down so that I don't see this piece of wood, but I can pick up a target on the other side. As you can see, I'm not sensing the wood, but the capacitive switch can pick up my hand on the other side. This property is very useful in level sensing applications. In a level sensing application, a capacitive switch can be mounted in a mounting well. This happens to be a one and a quarter inch national pipe thread Teflon mounting well. Once the well is mounted in a tank, the switch goes into the well. You can tune out the mounting well and sense the target material. Another way to mount a capacitive switch for a level application is in a sight glass clamp. In this case, I've got the unit mounted inside the clamp and we can actually sense the level inside the glass tube. Right now, the capacitive switch cannot sense this glass tube. Let's see what happens when we bring this liquid into the field of the switch. As you can see, the capacitive switch sensed the liquid through the glass tube. Now we've learned how to use both inductive and capacitive switches. Let's look at how we can increase the reliability of these sensors in your applications. We design effector proximity switches to give you long-term reliable performance. You can realize this performance by avoiding some common problem situations. Some of these problems can cause mechanical damage to the switch. First, avoid having the target approach axially or head on. If the target travels too far, it may cause physical damage to the switch. Instead, use the proximity switch so the target approaches radially or from the side so over travel won't damage the switch. When mounting threaded tubular units, don't over tighten the mounting nuts. If vibration might be a problem, use an adhesive such as Loctite to secure the nuts. Sometimes a tubular switch is installed with a set screw to hold it. It's very easy to over tighten the set screw and damage the switch. So try to avoid set screws altogether. But if this is the only configuration that will work in your application, put a small nylon ball in the hole to protect the switch. As with any electronic device, avoid stress on the wiring. Incorporate a single turn service loop but don't use so much wire that you build an antenna for RFI. And on terminal chamber units, use the strain relief supplied with the proper size cable so they're effective. To use threaded units with conduit, use our conduit adapters and don't pull hard enough to rip the wires out of the switch. If there's a lot of vibration, use flexible conduit to avoid damaging the switch. For applications where the wiring will flex, use a switch with high flex cable.
or install flexible cable on a terminal chamber unit. Other potential problems can be caused by environmental factors. Most effector switches have an operating temperature range of minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit to 176 degrees Fahrenheit. For any sensor, the worst conditions are a condensing atmosphere combined with wide temperature fluctuations, such as cool down at the end of a shift. This is a particularly deadly combination for mechanical switches where rapid cool down can cause the switch to suck in moisture at the actuator seal or the cable entry. Because there is no actuator on a proximity switch, the only place moisture can enter is at the cable entry and that's easier to seal. In wet applications, use switches with potted cables whenever possible. If that's not possible, fill the entire terminal chamber areas with a temperature stable, non-conductive waterproof grease, for example, super lube sold by Permatex, or lube gel sold by Radio Shack. Our plastic housings are very resistant to most industrial solvents, alkalis, oils, and mild acids. For particularly severe environments, use our Teflon tops, caps, or bodies to protect threaded tubular units against abrasion and chemical attack. For oily environments, it's also a good idea to specify polyurethane, or PUR, cables. And whenever a capacitive switch is immersed in a liquid, always, repeat always, use a mounting well to protect the switch. A third area to watch involves electrical problems. Many DC switches include overload and short circuit protection on the output leads. However, you must always be careful of using incandescent lamps on the output of proximity switches. The cold filament inrush current can be eight to 10 times larger than the steady state current either damaging the switch, or if the unit has overload protection, causing it to operate erratically until the filament heats up. On AC units, don't use any lamp larger than six watts. All of our inductive switches are well protected against RFI. You can help avoid problems by keeping wiring as short as possible. If you do experience a problem, moving the wiring or shielding it will often solve the problem. Problems caused by static charges normally only affect capacitive switches by causing dry materials to cling to the face of the switch. In level sensing applications, try to always use the switch in a part of the system covered by static eliminators. If that's not possible, ground the hopper itself if it is metal. If it's not, locate a ground close to the switch itself but not close enough to be sensed. In many cases, our Teflon wells will reduce the amount of material which does cling. Avoid these potential problems and proximity switches will bring a long list of advantages to your installations. They will let you sense targets accurately and reliably without any physical contact. They will stand up to harsh environments better than mechanical switches and they can perform a wide variety of sensing functions, including targets that move too rapidly for mechanical switches. They will operate from most power sources, are available in a broad variety of mechanical configurations, with a choice of wiring styles to fit your application needs. Effector proximity switches give you the technology to solve your position sensing problems and they're available with complete technical support throughout the United States, Canada, and Mexico. In fact, effector proximity switches with the exact same part numbers and same support are available to your suppliers and your customers from northern Sweden to southern Spain, from Western Ireland to Eastern Europe, and in every industrial center throughout Asia and the Pacific Rim. If applied properly, inductive and capacitive switches can give you a reliable signal every time. The key is to select the right switch for the right application. IFM Effector's goal is to provide you with quality switches and back them up with excellent service.
Our engineers are available to answer your technical questions or help you with applications. In order to provide you with local service, Effector Proximity Switches are stocked throughout North America by our representative partners and our branch offices. The Effector Sensor Catalog contains in the back the complete listing for all of these companies and their addresses. IFM Effector Switches are also available worldwide. In all locations, the same part numbers are used to purchase the switches. Furthermore, with our worldwide network, we can service the original equipment manufacturers and also the end users in any market. I would like to thank you for viewing our training seminar. If you have any questions, please contact us. Good luck with all your proximity switch applications.